Hello, welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. When Marlena Dietrich died in her 91st year, it was hard to believe that she was that old. But she had lived through really generations of life and people. Her life in many ways was like a John Dos Passos novel. The people who passed through it from Ernest Hemingway to Jean Gabin to General Gavin. She was a woman who was an icon to many generations, an inspiration. But she was also a woman and a mother. And her daughter, Maria Riva, has written the book Marlena Dietrich by her daughter. And as a daughter, she knows a truth about the woman that no one else probably will ever know. But she's put it into this, no this novel, this book, but it reads like a novel. The book is published by Knopf, and we'll be back after a short pause. At first, we didn't know what to think. He said he was gay. We thought we had done something. I was so angry, so hurt. We didn't know where to turn. Talking to other families at Parents Flag was a lifesaver. Now we're closer than ever. She's the same daughter she always was. We love him just as much as always. Parents Flag helped us through it. You are not alone. Talk to us. We understand. For the Parents Helpline nearest you, call 1-800-4-FAMILY. Watching the world from my safety seat As we go for a ride in the car, car, car When we want to go near our far, far, far We'll be safe when we ride in the car Talking with Maria Riva, author of Marlena Dietrich by her daughter, published by Knopf. Welcome, Maria. Thank you for having me. And I said this read like a novel, and as I was thinking, it really is not unlike a Tom Jones picaresque novel that begins in Germany with her birth and 91 years later in Paris. And as a mother, in a way, she was a Don Quixote, making you, in some respects, a Sancho Panza. <laughs> That's what Eric Maria Remarque called me. Um, I, I think what I would have wanted to write this even if she wasn't my mother, because she was such a fascinating woman, and she lived through such fascinating times. And that's why I wanted to start at the very beginning, because people have roots. Something happens. They grow from somewhere. And this whole Victorian Edwardian era in Prussian Germany, which established this rote, this sense of duty, this coldness in the mother uh, that this child grew up with. And I had her childhood diaries, and they're fascinating to me. And it was a world of women, mm -hmm. uh, except for the violin teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and how he escaped to the drop, we never know, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, this whole thing of, of having this, this Germanic upbringing and this our aristocratic upbringing, because, you know, Dietrich was not like any other movie star. Uh, she did not like being a movie star. She looked down on actors, certainly Hollywood actors were the dregs as far as Dietrich was concerned, because she considered herself the aristocrat. And she only came to Hollywood because of von Sternberg, her discoverer, right? Mm -hmm. And so she, it was her duty to be what he had envisioned, what he created, that wonderful face, right? Yeah. And this is what her whole life was dedicated to, this sense of duty of doing what he wanted, what embellish the legend, recreate the legend, polish the legend, represent the legend, always that sense of beauty, that Germanic Prussian sense of beauty. You talk about her as preferring the romance, but not the finality of the chase. <laughs> well, and there again we go with the aristocrat. Aristocrats, you see, it, now I'm mm -hmm. quoting Dietrich, right? Aristocrats spout poetry, Heine, they hold hands, 
they, uh, they go into the fields of poppies with the sunlight, and they love each other. Sex is for the peasants. Uh, there are pictures of her in this book, one especially with uh, the little sparrow, uh, who you say had a backbone of steel, mm -hmm. Edith Piaf. A very ugly woman. Mm -hmm. a, a wonderful artist on the stage, but a very ugly woman as far as I'm concerned. That's my own opinion. Uh, for her, there was no difference, really, in a sense, between men and women. It oh, no. Was, yeah, it was a total homogeneous mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. But then, again, that is, again, her background of the, uh, the 20s in Berlin, which was the Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. of that time, where cross-dressing was accepted. It was quite normal. Uh, no one made uh, was surprised by it, except when she came to America. America, she suddenly found that uh, what she called Puritans, these Puritans, suddenly were very shocked by a woman who wore men's clothing. And Dietrich always said, the only comfortable clothes in the world are men's clothes. And of course, uh, again, uh, time has proven her right. Maria, you as a daughter, let's talk about a woman who didn't want you to learn English, mm -hmm. who kept you out of school almost as if you were the trained animal to her as a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, how many years in analysis to get over that? <laughs> no, you know, it was, it, you, one thing I always try to explain is that I was a German child. And German children uh, don't question, and they don't complain, and they do what they're told to do. And sometimes in that uh, structure, uh, it's not quite as confusing, because uh, you don't question, you don't think that the, your life is different or that uh, you want something else. Uh, you, you would never even dream of thinking that you can want something else. You have what you have, and you do your duty. And uh, Dietrich believed that I was her product. And uh, therefore, I had to be what she considered was a fitting product uh, for her creation. Because she used to say to me when I was pregnant, I made your nails one day, and then I made your hair, and then I made your teeth. I didn't do that very well. And then, uh, I, but I gave you my brain, and therefore you're brilliant. You see, uh, it was uh, it, her child had to be her pr uh, her production. Uh, people have commented about. At age 15, you're being raped, seduced, etc., by another woman mm -hmm. that she had put you in that apartment. Mm -hmm. Do you think she was really aware of what was happening? Oh, I do not think that Dietrich ever was aware of uh, reality. She created her own world, she created her own reality, and because of her fame and her power, society permitted it and agreed with her. When you, uh, when you say that the sky is green, and the world says, oh yes, if you say the sky is green, then of course we agree. Mm -hmm. It must be green. You can't really blame somebody for feeling that omnipotent, you say. Marie, I remember you as an actress uh, in the <laughs> early days of television. And very you were early days. Uh, yeah, but you were very <laughs> talented. And I always wondered, I wonder what happened to her career. I read this book and I see you gave it up to be her Sancho Panza, to be the one who traveled and advised and became the mother to the child. Well, actually, I gave it up in order to have a happy marriage and uh, to not fall into the trap of success. Uh, I was given a contract uh, in Hollywood, and uh, it would have meant moving my family out to California when uh, live television went to film. And my husband's work was in New York. And I knew the pitfalls that might await that situation. And so I gave it up and uh, had two more children, which is much better than a career, much better. Marlena as a grandmother, because there's a <laughs> year where she is having something done to her legs, and she sends your sons a photograph of her leg with, mm -hmm. with steel pins saying, this is why I can't send you any money for Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was done a bit more cruelly than that. You're so nice, you see, you can't even say the words, no money this Christmas. That's a Dietrich line. Yeah. Uh, it, um, she had to be in control. Uh, whether she was in control uh, through sarcasm, or she was in control uh, through manipulation, or she was in control through any means that she uh, at hand, she had to control any situation. She controlled her life, she controlled her legend, she did that brilliantly. 
we wouldn't be here talking about it if it wasn't. But what's interesting is life plays a dirty trick. Mm -hmm. She couldn't control age. Mm -hmm. Well, she couldn't control also uh, her own lack of knowledge of what real love was. I think the Dietrich's uh, tragedy, it, the story of Dietrich is really a tragedy because I do not believe that she ever knew what real love was or ever felt what real love could be. She accepted the adulation of very brilliant men, many, many men, yeah. as though she were on an altar and the worshipers were coming with gifts. The icon. Mm -hmm. And she took it and then was for them everything they'd ever dreamt of because she was a magnificent actress in life, much more so than yeah. on the screen. But it was also this sort of borderline madness of being able to be whatever you want to be without conscious thought. It wasn't calculated. It wasn't a Joan Crawford. Yeah. Who, used to, who would say, I will say this in order to achieve this, in order to get there, in order to have this. No, no, no. Dietrich just was, suddenly, out of nowhere. She was exactly what this particular man or that woman or this situation called for, without conscious thought, and then could switch in a second and be something else. It's a little eerie to live with that kind of person. Yeah, because where is reality? Mm -hmm. But that's what you said mm -hmm. earlier. I mean, there she is with Eric Remarque, Eric Maria Remarque, one of the great writers, and she's lusting, what, after Jean Gabin at that oh, time? Oh, yes, and also yeah. uh, Gavin, and also uh, uh, Ambassador Kennedy. Poor uh, Boney, as we called uh, Remark, went through quite a lot. And of course, there's the point where she says, well, you played with Joe's children on the beach. <laughs> uh, do you remember that period? Oh, yes. They, to me, rep the Kennedy family in 1939, uh, 38 and 39, in the south of France, were for me the epitome of everything that I really would have liked to have been. First of all, they were, they were all slender, you know, and I was fat. Then they had no pimples, and I yeah. had pimples. And they were free, and they were American, and I was, you know, the all-European all child. I had to be yeah. a European, I had to be German, I had to be this. And they were free, and they were Americans, and they had a big family, and they talked together, and they sat at long tables and ate together. I thought that was, uh, you know, just a fairy tale. And at the end, there's a wonderful line about, Maximilian Schell saying, <laughs> I've got to go read Proust before I can do that famous documentary did with mm -hmm. her called Marlena. Mm -hmm. And Dietrich, of course. I had set this documentary up and uh, my mother uh, called me up in Switzerland, she was in Paris, and she said, Proust? He has to go and read Proust? To yeah talk to a movie star? You know, the poor yeah. Max, he really yeah. uh, nearly lost his job on that one. And at the bottom is sort of talk about farewell to arms, farewell to beauty, just a gigolo. It, her self-humor, you know, Dietrich had what Mae West had, and I think that's why they were uh, pals. Uh, they were not only neighbors of each other at Paramount dressing rooms, but they had this ability at their very best, uh, to laugh at their own creation of themselves. Yeah. And they truly were people who created themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe in a way that was the best creation of all is Marlena Dietrich. But Maria, I think you've done a superb job in this. Okay. I mean, really reading it, if you didn't even know that those names you're reading were famous names, it, there's such a flow and such an intrigue to the plot of her life. Oh, thank you. A, a writer could not have created anything better. <laughs> will you autograph my book? Thank you very much. And I'll we'll be, be back to. after a short pause. Thank you.